Welcome back to the deep dive. You know, we often get requests to cover the really, like the really fundamental stuff. And today we're diving right into one of those core concepts, mm. electric charge and electric fields. Yeah, it's amazing how something so fundamental can be so, well, powerful. I mean, these ideas are the basis for like so much of modern technology. Absolutely. And the material you sent over does a great job of laying it all out. We've got everything from like the basic building blocks of charge all the way to these forces and fields that they create. Our mission here is to unpack it all, find the most intriguing bits, and hopefully give you a clear sense of these essential ideas. Sounds good. So where do we start? Well, let's begin at the beginning. The nature of electric charge itself. The material kicks off by saying it's a fundamental property of matter, just like mass. And right away, it highlights this elegance of two types, positive and negative. And this beautiful, simple rule like charges repel, opposites attract, kind of a fundamental dance of the universe. Yeah, it really is. And it's not just some abstract concept. These charges are carried by actual particles. Protons, tucked away in the nucleus, have that positive charge. And electrons, whizzing around, carry the negative charge. Right. And then there are neutrons also in the nucleus, but those are electrically neutral. And what's interesting the material points out is that the magnitude of the charge, like the amount of charge, is exactly the same for a single electron and a single proton. Like it's a fundamental unit, a tiny little quantum of electricity. Yeah, exactly. And that balance is why most things we see every day appear electrically neutral. A neutral atom it's got equal numbers of protons and electrons, so their charges perfectly cancel out. Now, what happens when that balance gets messed up? That's where we get these things called ions, right? Exactly. An ion is just an atom that's either gained or lost electrons. So if it loses an electron, say, it ends up with a surplus of positive charge from those protons and becomes a positive ion. Makes sense. And if it snags an extra electron? Then it's got more negative charges and becomes a negative ion. This process, gaining or losing electrons, is called ionization. Super important in chemistry, physics, basically everything, like the air we breathe, mm -hmm. even the reactions happening inside us right now. Okay, so from these tiny atoms and ions, we zoom out to like everyday objects. And, you know, we think of things as charged or not, but the material makes this really interesting point. Even in a charged object, it's only a tiny, tiny fraction of the total charge that's actually making it charged. Like, imagine a huge stadium packed with people and just a handful move from one side to the other. Right. It's that subtle shift in balance that makes all the difference. And that brings us to a really, really important principle, the conservation of charge. Like, this is a fundamental law of the universe. Yeah, the material stresses that. It's like, no matter what you do, the total amount of charge in a closed system stays the same. You can't create it. You can't destroy it. You can only move it around. Yeah, like shuffling cards. Yeah. You can rearrange them, but you always have the same number of cards. Okay, so now that we know what charge is, the types, its connection to those tiny particles, and this big idea that it's always conserved, how do things actually become charged in the first place? Well, the material talks about a few ways. One that everyone probably remembers is charging by friction, like, you know, rubbing a balloon on your hair. That's called the triboelectric effect, a fancy name for a simple idea. Right. The classic example is rubbing a plastic rod with fur. The rod becomes negatively charged and the fur becomes positive. What's actually happening, electrons are jumping ship from the fur to the rod. Exactly. And if you use a glass rod and silk, it's the opposite. The glass becomes positive because electrons move from the glass to the silk. So different materials have different like electron greed. Yeah, you could think of it that way. Some hold on to electrons more tightly than others. Okay, I get it. Now, the material also mentions this thing called polarization. Like, a charged object can actually exert a force on a neutral object without, like, directly transferring charge. How does that even work? Yeah, polarization is pretty subtle, but it's happening all around us. Think of a charged comb attracting tiny bits of paper. Okay, so the comb, let's say it's positively charged. It attracts the electrons in those paper molecules, but repels the positive nuclei. Right, so you get this tiny separation of charge within each molecule. It's still neutral overall, but one side's slightly more negative and the other slightly positive. So the negative side's closer to the positive comb, and since opposites attract, and that force is stronger at close range, the paper gets pulled toward the comb. It's like a tiny tug of war happening inside the paper. And this polarization is why dust sticks to your phone screen, even though the dust itself isn't charged initially. Wow, that's so cool. Like these microscopic interactions having big visible effects. Yeah. And then there's another way to charge things. Induction. 
It's a little more indirect. Okay, lay it on me. So imagine you bring a charged object close to a neutral conductor. Conductors, like metals, have those free electrons that can move around easily. Right. So let's say you have a negatively charged rod and you bring it close to a neutral metal sphere. The electrons in the sphere are going to be like, nope, got to get away from that negativity and they'll scoot as far away as they can. So now one side of the sphere is more positive because the electrons ran away. Exactly. Now, if we give those fleeing electrons an escape route, yeah. like connect the sphere to the ground for a sec, and then take away the rod. The sphere is left with a positive charge. It's like using one magnet to influence another without them ever touching. Yeah, a bit like that. Okay, so we know how charges exist, how they get on objects, but how do we actually like measure the forces between them? That's where Coulomb's law steps in. It's yeah. like the fundamental equation for electrostatic force. And the material even gives us the formula. F K frac 1 Q1 Q2 frac 1 pi epsilon Q. Okay, let's break that down. F is the force, the Q are the charges, and R is the distance between them. Right, so the force is directly proportional to the product of the charges. Double the charge, double the force. And it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance, so the further apart they are. The weaker the force gets. Yeah. That inverse square law, it's everywhere in physics. Gravity, light, sound. It's all about how things spread out in space. Now, those constants in the equation, Coulomb's constant and epsilon, the electric constant, like these fundamental numbers actually control the strength of this fundamental force. It's mind blowing, isn't it? That electric constant, it tells us how easy it is for an electric field to pass through empty space. It's like, how permissive is the vacuum to these fields? Right. And we have to remember, this force is a vector. It has both size and direction. Absolutely. The direction is always along the line connecting the charges. Like charges repel, so the force pushes them apart, and opposite charges pull each other closer. And just like with any good force, Newton's third law applies here, right? You bet. Equal and opposite reactions. The force charge one feels from charge two is equal in strength, but opposite in direction to the force charge two feels from charge one. It's a perfect dance. And if you throw more charges into the mix, it gets more complicated. Yeah, then we need the principle of superposition. Basically, the total force on any one charge is just the vector sum of all the forces from all the other charges. So it's like adding up all those individual pushes and pulls, taking yeah. into account their strength and directions. Exactly. Sometimes you got to break them down into components X, Y, Z to figure out the final force. But hey, that's what vectors are for. Okay, we can calculate the force between charges. But then the material brings up this whole electric field thing. What's the deal with that? What's the difference between force and field? It's a great question. The field is a way to think about the influence a charge has on the space around it, even if there's no other charge there to actually feel it. And like an aura, right? Kind of. Mm -hmm. The electric field at a point is defined as the force a tiny positive test charge would experience if it were placed there divided by the charge of that tiny test charge. So it's like you imagine the super small charge that doesn't create its own significant field just to see what's already there. Right. And the beauty of the field is that it exists regardless of whether there's another charge to test it. The source charge creates the field, and then that field can exert a force on any other charge that comes along. So it's a two-step process. Source charge creates the field. Field exerts force on any other charge that wanders in. Exactly. And the formula for the field from a single point charge is pretty simple. Right. Breaking it down, we've got the charge, the distance, that same electric constant in this thing. What's that? It's a unit vector, just points radially outward from the charge. Tells you the direction of the field. And that direction depends on whether the source charge is positive or negative, right? Yeah, for positive charges, the field points outward, pushing a positive test charge away. For negative charges, it points inward, pulling a positive test charge closer. It's also important to remember the material says that the electric field is a vector field. Every point in space has a specific magnitude and direction for the field. It's like, imagine the space around a charge filled with tiny little arrows, all pointing the way a positive charge would be pushed. And they even compare it to the gravitational field, which is the gravitational force per unit mass. Yeah, the electric field is the electric force per unit charge. Makes it easy to see the connection. So if you know the field, you can easily calculate the force on any charge. Just multiply the charge by the field. Right. And the force will be in the same direction as the field if the charge is positive, opposite direction if it's negative. Pretty straightforward. Now, what happens when we've got a bunch of charges, not just one lonely point charge? 
We use the principle of superposition again, but this time for electric fields. The total field at any point is just the vector sum of the fields from all the individual charges. So same idea as with forces, but now we're adding up fields instead. Exactly. Each charge contributes its own field, and we add them up as vectors, paying attention to both magnitude and direction. Now things get even more interesting when we go from individual point charges to like a whole smear of charge, like charge spread out along a line or over a surface. What happens then? Uh, that's where calculus comes in handy. Specifically integration. Basically, we imagine chopping up that charge distribution into infinitely small bits, each acting like a tiny point charge. Okay, so we treat each little bit as if it has its own tiny electric field, and then... We add up the fields from all those tiny bits using integration. Since the electric field is a vector, it usually involves integrating the components separately. It can get a bit messy, but the principle is pretty elegant. And the material introduces these charge densities to help us out. We've got linear charge density for charge along a line, surface charge density for charge over an area, and volume charge density for charge throughout a volume. Right, so linear density, it's like how much charge is packed into each unit of length. Surface density, it's charge per unit area. And volume density, you guessed it, charge per unit volume. And then the material lists uh, a bunch of examples where they actually calculate the fields for different charge distributions using integration like yeah. the field of an electric dipole, a charged ring, a charged disk. Yeah, they don't go into the nitty gritty math, but just knowing that these standard problems exist and that we can solve them using integration is pretty cool. It shows the power of calculus in dealing with real world situations. Okay, so fields are super useful, but they can be kind of hard to picture. That's where these electric field lines come in, right? Like they're a visual tool to help us grasp what these invisible fields are doing. Exactly. Electric sure. field lines are these imaginary lines we draw to represent the direction and strength of the field. So the tangent to the line at any point shows the direction of the electric field at that point. And the density of the lines, like how close together they are? That indicates the strength of the field. More, More sure. lines bunched together means a stronger field. And the material says field lines always start at positive charges and end at negative charges. And in empty space, they have to be continuous, no sudden starts or stops. Yeah, and a super important rule. Field lines never, ever cross. If they did, it would mean the field has two directions at the same point, which is impossible. Right. It's like one point in space can only have one electric field direction. Precisely. And for a special case, a uniform electric field, like the one you'd find between two large, oppositely charged plates, the field lines are nice and straight, parallel, and equally spaced. Like soldiers marching in formation. So uniform field, straight lines, easy peasy. Now, there's this common misconception that the path a charged particle takes in a field is always along a field line, but that's not always true. Yeah, the material emphasizes that. The field line shows the direction of the force on a positive charge, but the actual path depends on the particle's initial velocity, too. Like, imagine throwing a ball in a gravitational field. The field lines point straight down, but the ball follows a curved path. Makes sense. Okay, last but not least, we have these electric dipoles. Why do they get their own special section? Dipoles are a really common and important arrangement of charge. It's just two equal and opposite charges separated by a small distance, like a positive and a negative charge close together. And a lot of molecules in nature act like dipoles, right? Because of how their atoms and electrons are arranged. Exactly. They've got this inherent separation of charge. And that leads to this handy concept called the electric dipole moment. It's basically a vector that points from the negative charge to the positive charge and its magnitude tells you how separated the charges are. Right, so it's vec q, where q is the magnitude of either charge, and is that displacement vector pointing from negative to positive. And the units are coulomb meters. Got it. Now, what happens when you stick a dipole in an electric field? It experiences a torque, a twisting force. The field tries to align the dipole moment with itself. Kind of like a compass needle aligning with the Earth's magnetic field. Exactly. And the formula for the torque is a cross product. Its magnitude depends on the angle between the dipole moment and the field. Right, so maximum torque when they're perpendicular, zero torque when they're parallel or anti-parallel. Makes sense. And there's also potential energy involved. Hmm. The dipole has its lowest potential energy when it's aligned with the field, highest when it's opposite. 
Like it wants to be a line. That's its happy place. Yeah, you could say that. And one last thing, dipoles create their own electric fields, which is just the combination of the fields from the two individual charges. Makes sense. Two charges, two fields, add them up. But there's a twist, right? The material says that at large distances, the field from a dipole weakens faster than the field from a single charge. Yeah, that's because the positive and negative charges are so close together. Their fields partially cancel out at a distance, so the overall field strength drops off more quickly. It's like they're working against each other, in a way. In a sense, yes. And this behavior of dipole fields is super important in all sorts of areas, like understanding how molecules interact, and how materials respond to electric fields. Well, wow, we've covered a ton of ground today. From the very basics of charge all the way to these electric dipoles and their fields, it feels like a truly comprehensive deep dive into this fundamental topic. I agree. It's amazing how much complexity arises from these simple ideas of positive and negative charges. And the fact that we can describe these interactions with math and visualize them with tools like field lines is truly a testament to the power of physics. Absolutely. Understanding these concepts opens up a whole world of possibilities from the microscopic to the macroscopic. It really makes you wonder what other fundamental principles are out there, maybe still undiscovered, that shape the universe in equally profound ways. That's something to ponder. Thanks for joining us on this electrifying journey.